Greetings, exiles. I'm Cod Raziel, and joining me as always are Sir Reginald Amadeus Fortescue III and Frank. And today we're going over our Blood Magic Life Armor Modular Dark Pack Totems. So let's start with the base version or the budget version, which requires the smallest amount of gear and levels. We only need a 5 link for this version of the build, and it gives us a total of 3 totems. So first of all, let's go over the important gear. Most importantly, we use the Soul Mantle Spider Silk Robe. What this does for us is it gives us one additional totem, which is basically at this point a 50% more damage multiplier to a single target. It also gives us an extra link, that being a level 20 spell totem supported in the chest. And it does have the drawback of cursing you when the totems die. But in order to rectify this, we use the Kikazaru Topaz Ring, which gives us 40% reduced curse effect on you. While we're using two of these, we get 80% reduced curse effect, and along with the Ascendance Guardian node, we're capped at 105%, and no curses have any negative effects on us. In addition to this, we use the Self-Flagellation Jewel, which gives us 10-20% to increased damage per curse on you which in a sustained fight generally works out to about 160% increased damage in my case. Along with that we're using a few other uniques. First of all we're using the Apex Rage 1. This gives us a massive amount of cast speed while also giving us some flat added chaos damage. I like the increased cast speed for the dark pack totems because it causes them to fire that little bit quicker, which means that our clear speed is boosted by this. Next we're using the Lion Eyes Remorse Pinnacle Tower Shield. This gives us a lot of life and a lot of armor. It has decent block and it's very cheap to buy. It doesn't have any resistances, but our passive tree is going to fix that. Additionally, we use two unique jewels, one being Spire of Stone, which grants us totem life per allocated strength point in the radius. In our build, this equates to about 15% totem life, and it also makes it so that totems can't be stunned, which is quite helpful if something's cycloning over your totems or hitting them a bunch. Next, we use Energized Armor. This gives us an increased armor boost based on the energy shield that's allocated around it. So in total, the socket that we have energized armor in is giving us about 96% increased armor. And lastly, we're using the Blood Grip Marble Amulet. While this doesn't look like it fits into the build, it actually gives us a substantial survivability increase by not only giving us a lot of extra regeneration, but also nearly doubling the base value of all healing flasks. Like you'll notice in my Uber at Siri fight as well as some of the Guardian fights, I use one flask and I'm healed up. And as an added extra bonus, it has bleeding while moving deals no extra damage. So if something hits you with a puncture or something, then the bleeding won't kill you the moment you start moving around. This amulet also makes it possible for us to clear the labyrinth fairly effectively. So now let's go over the rares. Well, for our belt, we just want a high life and resistances belt with reduced flask charges used. Coupled with the node on the passive tree, this gives us up to 5 uses on our life flasks, which is fantastic. On our helmet, we just want high life, resistances and preferably armor. For enchants, we're looking for lightning warp reduced duration or lightning golem buff effect. Both of these will increase our clear speed substantially and I don't believe that going for a dark pack specific enchant is the way to go. So next let's go over boots. For boots we want some high movement speed as well as high life and resistances. For enchants we like the movement speed when you haven't been hit recently or you can just use a pair of two-toned boots to help round out your resistances. For gloves, we're looking for high life resistances and armor if we can. 
So let's go over the flasks that I'm using. First of all, I'm using a catalyzed eternal life flask of staunching. This is to remove any bleeds that are lingering on us or corrupting blood, as well as giving us a solution to heal all of our life over 2.6 seconds. Next, we're using a seething divine life flask of curing. This removes poison and also heals us for about 2,500 of our life with the passive tree and blood grip amulet. Next, we're using a defensive chemist's basalt flask of iron skin. This will boost our armor as well as giving us some extra physical damage reduction. We're then using a chemist's quicksilver flask of adrenaline. The chemist's affix is used on all of our utility flasks because it allows them to have more total uses. And the of adrenaline affix gives extra movement speed to the quicksilver flask, granting a substantial boost in movement speed whenever the flask is used. And lastly, we use a chemist's silver flask of heat. This gives us onslaught, which boosts both our cast speed and our movement speed a little bit more, while also functioning pretty well for lightning warp because its effectiveness is based both on movement speed and cast speed. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's go over how we're going to allocate our ascendancy points. For the normal labyrinth, since we are a scion, we don't really have much to gain. So we pick up the plus 20 strength and intelligence node that leads to the Templar, and we pick up the plus 40 intelligence node that leads to the Witch. Following on to Cruel, we pick up the passive point next to the Guardian, and then we pick up the Templar node from the Guardian, which grants us 25% reduced effect of curses on you. As mentioned, in combination with the Kikazaru rings, this makes us immune to curses. Next, we gain party charge sharing. What this means is if someone in the party gains a frenzy charge, everybody gains a frenzy charge. And likewise with endurance and power charges. And lastly, we gain 5% block as well as 10% attack cast and movement speed from any auras we cast. Since we're blood magic, we just use a level 1 clarity to gain this benefit. Next, we move on to the Merciless Labyrinth where we take the passive point leading into the witch and then we take the occultist now what the occultist does that's so great for us is it reduces chaos resistance by 15% to enemies you curse now through the different budgets for the build there are different ways to apply this curse we will be using a cast while channeling set and lastly for the eternal labyrinth we'll pick up a passive point and path of the witch which gives us access to some extra nodes at a reduced cost as well as giving us two extra passive points. So now let's go over the passive tree. Starting at the bottom of the science start we go through the resistance nodes and we then pick up the mana flask and life flask nodes to the right. These give us 50% increased life recovery from flasks, a little bit of life, and 15% reduced flask charges used, which in combination with the belt allows our life flasks to be used a total of 5 times. We then go to the left picking up Totemic Zeal for that extra totem placement speed and cast speed, and then coming through the Scion Life Rectangle for a large boost in life. You'll notice then that we focus on the bottom side near the Marauder heading over to Blood Magic. We pick up the Marauder Life Nodes, going down picking up Soul of Steel for a little bit of extra physical damage reduction and more resistances. We then go through Bloodless for some extra life, ending up with Blood Magic and Mortal Conviction for a lot of increased life. And above it we have some more Totem Nodes to take. Next we go up from the Scion Life Rectangle ending up by the Templar side. We start by picking up the Jewel Socket in which we will be socketing our Spire of Stone. And then we pick up another cluster of Totem Nodes going into the Templar and picking up more Life Nodes, more Spell Damage Nodes and some increased AoE. And then coming through to Elementalist, while the damage bonus from Elementalist doesn't give us anything, 
we do gain 12% all resist. We also pick up Light of Divinity because it's on the way and it gives us some spell damage and cast speed. We pick up some more life nodes underneath the jewel socket. We then pick up the jewel socket as well as the energy shield and armor nodes above it. These coupled with the energized armor jewel give us 96% increased armor and 8% all resist. Next we go over and pick up Ancestral Bond along with all the totem nodes around it. This gives us an additional totem and as mentioned before for each totem it's a massive damage boost to a single target. And also a large boost to clear speed since you don't need to hang around while the totem finishes off enemies. We then also pick up the life and chaos resistance nodes above that. Lastly, once we've picked up Path of the Witch, we come through the Witch's Tree, through the spell damage through the cast speed into Occultist Dominion. We then go over the life and mana nodes into the AOE nodes that are available to the witch and we go to the left to pick up the totem damage and totem placement speed nodes. So now let's go over the skill gems. Starting with the most important, the chest armor. In a 5 link, we're looking at socketing dark pact, void manipulation, controlled destruction, added chaos damage and faster casting. Looking over at our movement skill setup on the boots, we have Lightning Warp, Less Duration, Swift Affliction, and Faster Casting. A Lightning Warp setup, since we had the extra sockets available, seemed like the best idea for me, and I would also like to get more comfortable with Lightning Warp. In our shield, we have a standard Cast When Damage Taken Immortal Call setup, consisting of Immortal Call, Cast When Damage Taken, and Increased Duration. And then in our helm, in the budget version of the build, we have Wither, Cast Wall Channeling, Temporal Chains, and Molten Shell. The Cast Wall Channeling Temporal Chains allows us to curse enemies that require us to deal more damage to them. Most enemies won't need to be cursed to be killed quickly, but when we're fighting bosses or tanky rares, essence mobs, that sort of thing, we have the option to curse them with the Cast Wall Channeling Wither. We also have Molten Shell linked here since this boosts our armor substantially while we're channeling. In our wand, again on the budget version, we have Lightning Golem with Minion Life and Minion and Totem Elemental Resistance. Later on when we upgrade our gear we'll be putting the Lightning Golem in cast while channeling, but for now we need it to be as tanky as possible. And lastly in our gloves, we just have a random hodgepodge of gems and this is to basically prepare us for later on. We put our clarity in here as well as enfeeble with cast when damage taken and increased duration. Now the only really necessary gem here is clarity. The enfeeble is just there because I had the sockets available. So let's go over the capabilities of the different versions of the build before we get into how to upgrade to the other versions of the build. First of all, if we look at the Eternal Labyrinth, the, while the rarity version is not that functional in, in the Eternal Labyrinth, the budget version is more than capable of doing most six key days, and the end game version can do pretty much any combination of SRO mods. As for the Guardians, the rarity version would be a struggle. The budget version would kind of be able to do it, but the end game version can pretty much take on all of the Guardians as seen in my previous video. As for Atsiri, the rarity version is more than capable of taking out Atsiri and the bosses before without much trouble. So any any of the setups can do Atsiri. As for Uber Atsiri, however, since there is a lot more moving around and dodging and you need a lot more damage, I recommend at least having the budget version going before you do this. Don't try to do it in your rarity gear. And I would highly recommend that if you're new to Uber Atsiri that you go for the end game version before you take on Uber Atsiri. As for the Shaper, I really wouldn't attempt the Shaper with anything other than the end game version. While I was able to complete it with the 5 link budget setup, it was extremely harrowing and 
it probably wasn't worth the risk. You will probably fail one out of every two runs. As for tier 1 to tier 10, white and yellow maps, the rarity version is more than capable of handling them, as is the budget version and the in-game version. Once we get to tier 11 plus maps, we'll start transferring out of the rarity version into at least the budget version and possibly the end game version if we're there already gear wise. Now on to the conclusion. I have found that the Dark Pack Totems Ascendant is one of the most fantastic builds I've ever played around with. It's able to do all of the end game things that I normally have to create multiple characters to do and the playstyle is quite fun mirroring in some way the Siege Ballistas build I was so happy with last league. I would definitely recommend this even from the low budget standpoint and then working your way up which once the end game version comes out I'll explain a little bit more about how to grow your character into an end game version. So from myself, Sir Reginald Amadeus Fortescue III and Frank, we'd like to thank you for watching and if you enjoyed the video, please do like and subscribe and share and all that business and good luck and stay juicy.